Hello, I'm Melissa Idris and I'm here with Dr. Carl Benedict Frey, who is a Oxford Martin City Fellow at the Oxford at Oxford University, where he directs a program on the future of work at the Oxford Martin School. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, I want to talk to you about the future of work, which is your field of research. Um, with every technological revolution, it seems that people have always lost jobs. So what do you think the history, if we look back at history, what do you think, just looking back at history of all the technological revolutions, what can that teach us about the economic anxiety and um, uncertainty and inequality that we're seeing today? So a couple of years ago, uh, Mike Osborne and I, we published a study estimating that roughly 47% of American jobs are at risk of being automated. And the study that we've been re getting since is, the one you ask is this time different somehow, what can we learn from yeah. past experience? And, and the point I tried to make in the book is that we've been through very different periods of technological change in the past, and this time so far looks most similar to the first industrial uh, revolution in Britain. Uh, which had very uh, many similar economic features. So this was a time with, with um, middle-income jobs disappearing, wages were stagnant or uh, even falling at the bottom end of the income distribution, even as the British economy took off. And it was also a period of not only economic polarization, but also a lot of social and political polarization. Um, and I think uh, there are things that we can learn from that um, today, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a tendency, at least in the industrial West, to take technological progress for granted. Uh, we take it for granted, okay. I think that um, a lot of people seem to think that it is somehow inevitable. Mm. Uh, but it's not. They, no, I don't think so, because a lot of history has actually been workers and governments fiercely resisting the introduction of new technologies over fears of job loss and, okay. and political instability. Mm. Um, and we've already seen a back backlash against globalization. Um, and automation so far has had very similar effects. Okay. Uh, but we've seen nothing yet as artificial intelligence becomes more pervasive. Uh, so will automation and its effects. All right, okay. So many things that you brought up there that I want to delve into, which I'm hoping we get to do in this interview. But first of all, I want to come back to the fact that you said that this time right now feels very similar to the first industrial revolution. So you talked about the loss of middle income jobs, you, um, about the polarization both uh, politically and you know, socially. Um, what what dif uh, similarities do you see? Why is it similar to the first industrial revolution in terms of its characteristics? Not just in terms of its symptoms, but why, why is this similar to the first one and not the others? So I think a lot depends on what type of technology you have, right? And obviously, in many ways, the computer technologies of today are very different from the spinning machines of the sure. Industrial Revolution. But what they have in common is that they are of the replacing sort. So oh. it's, you know, different technologies have different effects. So if you think about a technology like the automatic elevator, right? It replaced the elevator operator. Oh. That's very different from the telescope, which you know allowed us to do new and inconceivable things. If it anything created new tasks for people, mm. it didn't replace any jobs. And when technologies of the replacing sort, we tend to see many of the trends that we had in recent decades, like stagnant wages, um, and that was indeed also a feature of the um, first industrial revolution. Many of these spinning machines replaced artists and workers who earned decent wages. And as a result of that, um, many of the discontents of the Industrial Revolution also being seen today. Mm, okay, so it is like a, a perfect sum. So you have, ish, uh, I guess, you know, characteristics like the replacing type of jobs, technology replacing um, certain types of jobs, and that's very relevant today. So talk to me a little bit about um, why you said technological progress is not inevitable. It seems to me that it is because, you know, technology just continues to grow and evolve as we innovate. And that is something that we've been talking about at the Kazana Megatrends Forum here in terms of our collective brain, right? So Indeed. tell me a little bit about that. 
Well, technology comes with what the great economist Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, right? So it means that we're creating something new, but in many cases we're also destroying the old. And that is certainly the case if you think about automation technologies, which threatens to replace um, a lot of jobs. Um, and historically, if you go back sort of to the days of the Roman Empire and even up until sort of the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, governments frequently blocked the introduction of new technologies for fears of a social unrest. The craft guilds had no interest in anything, um, making their jobs and uh, skills redundant, fiercely resisted new technologies. And if technological progress was inevitable, the Industrial Revolution would have happened a bit earlier in the history of mankind. <laughs> if it was inevitable, every country in the world would have adopted the same technologies to the same extent and would be rich as a consequence. Sure. But we're not seeing that. Okay. Um, so we're seeing, if anything, divergence in uh, adoption rates. So in that divergence, are you saying that countries, for instance, if we would just take a look at countries, countries that are technologically advanced, does, is it because their governments did not uh, limit them in terms of technological um, innovations? There, there wasn't so much of a backlash of governments stopping this from happening. Is that the differentiation in the divergence? So I think there are many reasons behind these sort of divergence patterns of technology adoption. Um, but I think that one of them has to do with attitudes towards technological progress and the sort of structure um, or the balance of political power in society. Oh. So in um, uh, 18th century Britain, uh, wealthy merchants became a class of growing affluence and also growing political power. Um, and their fortunes essentially rested upon a mechanization because um, that was what uh, kept British industry competitive um, in trade. Mm. Um, and the Luddites, who famously <laughs> smashed machinery, right? Yes. Um, they, you know, tried their best to make their voice heard, but property ownership was still a requirement for voting. So that group was essentially politically disenfranchised, and okay. mechanization was virtually enforced upon the population. Sometimes workers have a lot of political power, on the other hand. So if you go to a country like Argentina, you will discover that there are not that many railroads uh, you can uh, use and take advantage of. And one reason for that is that the lorry union is very strong. In and they Argentina. have no Exactly. And they have no interest of uh, the introduction of railroads in the country. So there's a lot of vested interests which shape mm. patterns of technology adoption. It's not the only uh, uh, driver. But it is certainly an, uh, a key explanatory, f uh, explanatory fact. Okay, so the, the balance of power within societies will explain just how much technology innovation is adopted. All right, we're going to continue this conversation shortly. Make sure you stay tuned to Astro Awani. <laughs>